Stories with unexpected twists and turns seem to be all the rage these days. But what about a story where even the writers don't know what's coming? Welcome back to The Story Symphony, the collaborative fiction podcast where each chapter of the story is written by an entirely different person. You, the listener, won't have any idea what to expect next. And neither will we, the writers. So strap in and let's see where The Story Symphony will take us this time around. This is Chapter 3 and the finale of Season 2, Tin Foil Hats, by me, your host, Adrian Young. And here we go. Vanessa, is that you? I hadn't seen her in like ten years. But even under the thick black metal helmet she was wearing, there was no mistaking her. Everyone knew who she was. It's been so long. I met Vanessa back at uni when she started dating my friend Kyle. I lost touch with her not long after she graduated, although I did catch up with Kyle a few times after that until he straight up disappeared one day, never to be heard from again. No one knew what happened. Vanessa had also disappeared as well. And everyone thought they'd eloped somewhere together until the government announced out of nowhere that they'd put her in charge of dealing with the firefighters. It was so random, particularly to those of us who were friends with her. She was literally just some girl from Ballarat who'd graduated from uni not long ago and now was suddenly in charge of defeating Australia's most notorious terrorist organisation. But that's exactly what she did. And then she disappeared again. Are you okay, Callie? Yes, I am. I'm just... Well, what happened? You and Kyle just vanished off the face of the earth one day and then suddenly we started seeing you all over the news. We can catch up later when we're somewhere safe. Are you feeling all right? She was so matter-of-fact. I didn't remember her being like this at uni at all. I'm... Well, no, actually. I've had a pretty messed up night. Everywhere I've gone, people have been tearing each other apart like they've been possessed or something. It's crazy. Do you remember my brother Larry and Dane? I went to Dane's house earlier and he just straight up murdered Larry for no reason. And my housemate Ali? I found her completely decapitated in her room and freaked the hell out. That's concerning. Well, let's get you to safety, okay? I'm I'm parked just around the corner. Why don't you come with me? Yes, great. Oh oh my god, thank you. You're a lifesaver, quite literally. Come with me. I followed Vanessa around the corner. She gestured to a slick grey van, then clambered in. I followed her in and it took off before she could even slam the door shut properly. Uh, hi. Hi, guys. There were half a dozen very serious-looking men and women sitting in the van. They were all wearing the same weird combat helmets that Vanessa was wearing. They were all looking intently at me, and I couldn't help but notice they were all armed. Callie, we need to know who you've talked to tonight. I turned to look at Vanessa. Her face was expressionless. I definitely don't remember her being like this at uni. She was always a bit quiet and reserved, and sometimes didn't feel entirely engaged when you were talking to her, but I always thought she was just a little spacey. I definitely remember her being a bit more smiley. Um, uh, well, I talked to Dane when I went over to Larry's house and found that Dane had murdered him, and I I guess I spoke to Larry on the phone, and, and my ex, Alan, I went to his house because I didn't know where to go, and then his girlfriend went psycho, and I'm not just talking like Jella's girlfriend psycho, I mean, like zombie psycho. Okay. She turned to the man sitting next to me. Are you getting all of this, Hillard? Yes, Vanessa. I'm letting headquarters know now. Headquarters? What? They were being weird. I was beginning to feel a bit uneasy. Uh, hey, Vanessa. Do you know what's going on? It sounds like you do have some idea. Vanessa had begun furiously typing into her phone and had already disengaged from the conversation. We'll explain everything when we get back to the research centre. The- The the research centre? We're responding to a very serious outbreak of an infectious disease called the Hazar virus right now. The what virus? Never heard of it. 
It's a new virus that we've only become aware of over the past few months. Right. And where did it come from? Did, did it come from overseas? Well, as far as we can tell, it hasn't been detected anywhere else in the entire world outside of inner city Melbourne. We first became aware of it with the massacre at the Food Lab 2.0. We think they may have been linked. The Food Lab 2.0 massacre was a grisly killing spree that occurred late last year at the rebuilt facilities of Melbourne's most beloved company, the place that invented 3D printed negative calorie food. Dozens of employees there were massacred in broad daylight. No one knows who did it. Even the most disgruntled farmer wouldn't do something so horrific. Something was still bothering me. Hazar virus, Hazar. Why does that sound familiar? You might as well tell her, Vanessa. Tell me what? Something clicked. Hazar. Isn't that Kyle's last name? Vanessa sighed, put her phone down, and looked up at me. Hillard, I told you we should have gone with a less obvious code name. <sighs> okay, Khaled, you're right. Hazar was Kyle's last name. We named this virus after him because we believe he may be the cause of this virus. What? What do you mean the cause? Like he made a virus? Not quite. Look, this is going to sound pretty wacky, but essentially he was made into what's called an archive, which is when someone's consciousness becomes separated from their human body and gets transformed into a digital entity. Are you... Are you is this some kind of prank? We think Kyle has been trying to find ways to inhabit human bodies again. To possess them, if you will. But when he tries to do so, it does something to their brains which triggers an extreme level of paranoia and sends them into a murderous rampage. This is insane. And while we're calling it a virus, it seems to be only mildly infectious. In fact, it seems to wear off after less than three hours. That's one reason why we think it's only been relatively localised to just occurring in Melbourne so far. And the other reason? Well, we think the other reason it may be happening only in Melbourne is because Kyle is trying to get to me. The state of being archived has probably driven him insane and he must have started trying to get revenge on me for something that he thinks I've done. To try to get to me, we, we think he's trying to inhabit the bodies of our old friends in the hopes of finding more information and drawing me out. And we think you may have been patient zero. You think I... what? Vanessa, I'm sorry, you've lost your marbles. I'm sorry, Callie, we weren't going to tell you because it obviously wasn't you, but... What wasn't me? You. Well, not you. It, it was Kyle that caused it, obviously. But Kyle infected you a few months ago. And when you were infected... What? The massacre at the Food Lab 2.0. It was you. Vanessa, are you listening to yourself? You're saying I got infected by a digital version of your boyfriend and slaughtered a few dozen food scientists? <laughs> I'm sorry. Vanessa held up her phone, which was playing video footage of a few technicians standing around a giant food printer, with a giant nugget slowly being churned out of it. The nugget was bigger than all of the people combined. It was disgusting, but also beautiful at the same time. Then suddenly, a figure came out of nowhere with a crowbar. The technicians never knew what hit them. It was all over in less than 30 seconds. And it was, unmistakably, me. No, 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 what? That... What have I done? Don't worry, Callie, it's okay. That's not you. Your mind just went a bit haywire because Kyle tried to possess you. I, I killed those people! It's going to be okay, Callie. We're going to fix everything. What did she mean by fix? V Vanessa, where are you taking me? We're just taking you to our research centre. And with a few tests, we should be able to find a solution. What kind of tests? Relax, Callie. It didn't seem like she was going to give me any more information. And there wasn't much more I could do. So I sat back in silence and tried to come to terms with the fact that I'd massacred a few dozen people without even knowing it. Here, put this on. 
The man Vanessa called Hill had handed me a black combat helmet like the ones that everyone else was wearing. Why? It's lined with tinfoil to prevent any electromagnetic interference with the brain. Wait, you're telling me that government operatives wear tinfoil hats? Oh, absolutely. It's highly effective at preventing mind control technology. It's why we work so hard to convince the general population that it's all a myth. Surely this is all a dream. We were in what used to be called Little Italy, the strip of abandoned cafes and restaurants on Lycon Street in Carlton. I knew this place like the back of my hand because I used to come here all the time until the food lab created no-carb pizza and pasta. Then everyone stopped coming. Of course, everyone wanted to keep supporting local businesses, but everyone wanted to eat three pepperonis for breakfast and not have to do exercise to compensate more. What the- Suddenly, the weapons that everyone in the van had been carrying flew off into the distance, carried away like they were being drawn to some magnetic force. A few of the people that Vanessa had been travelling with dropped abruptly to the ground, as if they'd been tranquilised. We need to get you out of here. Run! Vanessa took off, and I started running after her. Whoever was attacking us was throwing what appeared to be smoke bombs at us, with the haze making it more and more difficult to see as we fled the scene. Vanessa. Hillard, is that you? Yes, I'm over here. What's going on? Who attacked us? It must have been Al and Apollo. Al and Apollo? I thought you took care of them. They escaped, unfortunately, but they are unimportant. Okay, well, let's get inside the research centre quickly and then we can figure out what to do from there. We'll need to... Hillard, are you okay? Hillard, where's your helmet? Hillard looked strange. He was standing extremely still and had been looking off into the distance while talking to us. And speaking of looking... There was something that was off about his eyes. They've been looking for you. You know, Al and Apollo. Just like I have been. What? We've all been looking for you. Trying to figure out why you did what you did. Why you betrayed us. Kyle? That's you, isn't it? Vanessa was slowly backing away. A look of fear in her eyes. This was the first time I'd seen her show genuine emotion. Meanwhile, Hillard had been walking slowly towards Vanessa. Then the streetlights shone suddenly on his face, and I could see his eyes. They were cloudy and colourless, just like Dane and Ellie's had been. You have a lot to answer for, Vanessa. I'm sorry, but I did what I had to do. Hillard, I mean, you, I mean, Hillard, really didn't leave me any other choice. And look how much better off the world is compared to a few years ago. Because you and your cronies simply archive anyone that gets in your way, right? I bet you haven't told our good friend here about your little tricks for maintaining public safety. Hey, Callie. It's been a while. Uh, uh, hi, Kyle? I'm sorry I didn't make it to your 30th birthday celebration. I had every intention of going, but Vanessa turned me into a ghost and then left me stranded in a digital purgatory forever. Um, don't worry about it. Vanessa, what is Kyle talking about? With the prison system overflowing, we recently thought of a new way to house criminals serving life sentences using archive technology. Basically, we would separate their consciousness from their bodies and store it on hard drives. Is horrific. Yes, but significantly more cost efficient than building new prisons, hiring more prison guards, and feeding criminals that are beyond saving. It worked for a while, but one day our servers began malfunctioning, and unfortunately, the archives of a large number of prisoners escaped. Well, I hope you're happy now, Vanessa, because the archives certainly aren't. They're furious at you, and once they find a way to properly take over human bodies, they're coming for you. Kyle, this needs to end. Can't you see how sick it's making people? When the archives try to inhabit human bodies, people's minds just collapse. Some of them literally start eating each other. It's your mind that's sick, Vanessa. Everything that's happened, what happened to me, this is all you're doing. Kyle, you don't understand. 
I did all of this for you. The reason I went along with all of this in the first place was to bide my time to try and work on the inside to try and find a way to bring you back properly. And I have, Kyle. Well, almost. I've been trying to build synthetic bodies that we can upload the consciousness of an archive into. And after that's finished, I was going to try to find you and and bring you back. And then together we could take on everyone who'd ever hurt us and make everything okay. You have to believe me, Kyle. I... Kyle? Hillard, or I guess Kyle, I think, had started twitching. He looked agitated. I need wedges. He abruptly turned around and ran off into the distance. Uh, okay, what just happened? It's one of the effects we've observed with the Hazar virus. First, the eyes lose coloration. Then the infected develops an overwhelming craving for potatoes. Out of all the weird things I'd heard in the past few hours, that was possibly the weirdest. But it does explain the insane amount of hash browns that Alan's girlfriend came back with. And then the victim starts having horrible hallucinations and becomes filled with uncontrollable bloodthirst for about three hours before returning back to normal. That is really messed up. And you caused this? I I can't believe it. What? Who are you? I know. But I had no choice. I was just following orders, and I genuinely thought I was doing the right thing. So what now? I'm going to take you with me to our research centre. Uh, why? Just a routine checkup. We want to make sure that all the infected are okay and that there's no permanent damage to their health, physically or mentally. I'm not sure I feel safe around you, Vanessa. Look, I understand. But you just have to trust me, okay? Besides, it's not very safe out on the streets at the moment, is it? This all felt wrong. Every instinct I had was telling me that I couldn't trust Vanessa, that I should just run away, away from this nightmare. But she was right. Going with her was the most sensible thing to do. Okay, lead the way. This is our research centre. The research centre looked exactly like what you'd expect a building housing a shady covert organisation to look like. A clinical, plain-looking facility staffed with clinical, plain-looking people scurrying about with not a hint of a smile on their faces. It was like a hospital, except that nobody looked like they had any interest in helping you. Callie, I'm just going to leave you in the waiting chamber for a few minutes while I go and debrief with my superiors. Um, who's in the waiting chamber? Relax, it's just other people who have recovered from the Hazar virus. We've brought them all in as a precautionary measure to make sure everyone that's been affected is okay and has no lingering health issues, and to see what assistance they need after this traumatic ordeal. There's tea, coffee and light refreshments inside. Given how shaken she was only minutes ago, It was bizarre seeing how quickly she reverted back to her distant, matter-of-fact self again. Hey, Callie. I just want to say... Thanks. Thanks? Yeah. Thanks for everything. What does she mean, thanks for everything? That was weird. I turned to look around the waiting chamber. There were maybe two dozen people inside, all looking a bit confused and unsure why they were there. Kelly! I looked to my left to see Dane coming towards me. He was still covered in blood, but aside from that, he looked normal. His face seemed calm, if a little dazed, definitely not like he wanted to tear me from limb to limb, which is how we left things about three hours ago. <laughs> Fancy seeing you here. You all right? I- I'm, well... <laughs> yeah. I know. I'm guessing they told you about that virus. Yeah. So messed up. I still can't believe it. But, well, I was leaving work and the next thing I knew I was in the middle of the night and I was in my garage with Larry's dead body. I'm so sorry about your brother, Kelly. Larry, with everything that had happened in the last few hours, I still hadn't even processed the fact that my brother was dead at the hands of his childhood best friend. It's okay, Dane. It's not your fault. 
that wasn't you who did that. And... And Grace... She's dead too. And I think... I think I might have killed her as well. I'm sorry, Dane. It's going to be okay. Vanessa will fix things. Vanessa? Is she here too? Yeah. W- wait, you haven't seen her? Suddenly, one of the walls of the waiting chamber began sliding open to reveal a ceiling-to-floor glass wall. On the other side stood Vanessa, flanked by a number of people. It felt like we were in an interrogation room. The hell? That's Vanessa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vanessa, and I am the general manager of this research centre. First of all, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to you tonight for the ordeal you have all experienced. As we have explained to some of you, the escaped souls of a number of digitally archived criminals were unfortunately let loose into the world. Thankfully, our software engineers have managed to fix our servers and we will be able to recall the escaped archives. After we've done that, we'll be able to upload the archives into the synthetic bodies that we've developed. We'll also digitally modify their memory so they'll be none the wiser. It'll be like all this never happened. However, there is one small snag in this plan. The synthetic bodies are almost as exactly the same as the real deal, except for one component. The heart. Despite their best efforts, our top scientists have been unable to create a replica of a human heart that can keep these synthetic bodies alive. They only seem to be able to work with real human hearts. Which brings us to you. I am deeply sorry, but I'm afraid that there is no happy ending for you. We'll be needing to take your hearts from you to power the synthetic bodies. I know this is not an ideal outcome for you, but you already know too much. And we couldn't risk any of this becoming public knowledge anyway. At least with this approach, we'll be solving two problems at once. You will all be archived shortly, with our servers subsequently wiping your record. This is to save your consciousness from having to live on in digital purgatory forever. Once we have collected your hearts from you, we will distribute your bodies across the crime scenes. The media will say that you are the unfortunate victims of the outbreak of a terrible disease, which has been successfully contained. I'm sorry it has come to this. Honestly, I am, but archiving is quick and painless, I assure you. Goodbye. There was a stunned silence in the room save for a few people murmuring to themselves. Um, what is she on about? What, what was that? Was that just some weird joke? I wished it was a joke, but I knew it wasn't. A panel in the ceiling opened. A contraption began slowly to emerge. It looked like a large spotlight, except instead of containing a light bulb, it contained... Nothing. I started feeling an itching sensation in my temple. I could tell everyone else felt it too because they were all reaching for their foreheads. Dane grabbed my hand. Or maybe I grabbed his hand, I'm not sure. Up ahead I could see Alan holding his new girlfriend's hand too. Outrageous. That would have been me if this were happening six months ago. Instead... Here I am, spending my final moments on Earth holding hands with my brother's childhood friend. Young Callie wouldn't have been caught dead holding Dane's hand, which, given the circumstances, was a bit ironic. Driving to the airport is not going to be a fun task. There's been reports of road closures all over the city, but I'm not going to let a spot of rain ruin our trip. Even if it's, well, more than a spot of rain. You're soaked! I really can't wait to get out of this godforsaken city. Also, 
I got your jam donut. Uh, no thanks. You can keep that. I haven't been dieting this hard all summer for you to just ruin my bikini bod right at the last minute. <laughs> well, suit yourself. We'll see how long you last with those continental breakfasts. When in Rome. Yeah, or when not in Melbourne. Hey, don't forget to turn onto the exit to Geelong. Huh? Oh, are we flying from Avalon Airport? Well, why's that? I didn't realise they did international flights. Well, they usually don't, but they have ever since Melbourne Airport was destroyed. The airport was destroyed? How did I not hear about that? Well, the news cycle is pretty hectic these days. It's easy to miss things. Yeah, but... I mean... That's a pretty big deal. But that's not the first thing I've missed recently, is it? Sometimes I feel like I've been asleep for years or something. <laughs> I love you, Kyle. I love you too, Vanessa. Today's chapter was written by none other than myself, the creator of this podcast. So I'm Adrian, a Melbourne-based writer with a passion for creating things. That's why you're listening to this podcast. The idea for the story symphony struck me one day as I was listening to a fiction podcast while thinking nostalgically about round-robin storytelling activities back in high school drama. And then I suddenly thought, hey, what would happen if I tried to combine these two things? So, with no prior experience with producing podcasts, but with a ton of passion for writing, and even more importantly, surrounded by a bunch of incredibly talented people, I embarked on a mad quest to create a round-robin storytelling podcast. And here we are. And that brings us to the end of this season of The Story Symphony. But don't be a stranger. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Story Symphony to join the discussion and maybe even get involved yourself. Callie was voiced by actor Carly Williams. You can stay up to date with all of the great work that she does by giving her a follow on Instagram at Carly, that's K-A-H-L-I, full stop Williams, or visiting her website, carlywilliams.com. Vanessa was voiced by actor, writer, and presenter Maddie Tyres, who you can find on Instagram and Twitter at Maddie Tyres. Hillard was voiced by comedian, actor, and director Jimmy James Eaton, who you can find on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Jimmy James Eaton. Dane and Kyle were voiced by actor, comedian, and podcaster Angus Brown, who you can find on Twitter and Instagram at Gus Gus Brown or on Facebook at Angus Brown Comedy. And last but not least, thank you to my dear friend Leanne Miyako, the absolute superstar who's been behind the amazing artwork for this podcast. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the story symphony as much as we've enjoyed putting it together. Until next time.